Meeple Nation Podcast, episode 372, City Building Games. Welcome, citizens of Meeple Nation. For the next 30 minutes, sit back and enjoy. Go get a game topper. Done. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> Most simple, concise sponsorship ever from Dave. Game Toppers LLC. Go get one now. Frillo, if you haven't seen the Game Toppers that we've had at different events, if you haven't been to GameToppersLLC.com, go check them out. If you're going to be at SaltCon end of summer, come check us out and come check out the toppers that we have there. They are awesome. They will enhance your gaming experience. I can't think of any gaming experience they wouldn't make better. Yeah, they'd make every gaming experience better. They really would. I was playing some games at Ashley's place with her fiance the other night, and I was talking up game toppers. Whether their coffee table or the table they bring out to play games on, both tables would have benefited from a game topper. GameToppersLLC.com Welcome to Meeple Nation. We are your hosts. I'm Nathan Howard. I'm Dave Holliday. I am Lord Logan Howard. I'm Andy Holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I guess, Logan, you're going to have to go a little bit into that, your lordship. I got suckered into an ad. It came up, why don't you just become a lord? And so I clicked on the website, and I bought a square foot of land in Scotland and earned the right to call myself lord. <laughs> so I am Lord Logan Howard of Wigshire Town in Scotland. And yeah. I'm jealous. They planted a tree because I paid them money and they gave me a card. And who knows if they actually planted the tree or if the lordship is real. So I could have just bought like a one in 10,000th share of the Brooklyn Bridge. Who knows? But I'm going full into it. So I am Lord Logan. The best thing about this deal is Logan got a two for one. So actuality, I guess I'm a lord too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> This week, we are discussing city building games, games that build buildings or cities. So this is really the tell of four cities. Good call, Lord Logan. Thank you. Let me change the title. Previously, we talked about these types of games. As always, we're going to hammer down a little bit and talk a little bit more in depth about four. We've each chosen a game to talk about. The game I chose to talk about is an oldie it is an extreme oldie this game was put out in 2000 it's called la chita or la cita or la cita that's how we always said it until we were told that we said it wrong so la chita is a game for two to five players uh, ages 12 and up it's a weight is listed at 3.28 and i don't really think that that's super accurate it says that it's 120 minutes playing time we actually just played it again to refresh ourselves it didn't seem to be quite that long it was designed by Gerd Fenchel, published by Cosmos. This is a game that we played a long time ago, early in my days of coming to game night here at HQ. This game is set in the Italian countryside. Every player represents a different city-state competing, vying for population. Each player starts with two cities, you go throughout the game trying to improve those cities, building different buildings that will allow for more population or will produce more food or produce gold or will just provide certain city services that the people are looking for. One of the things I thought was really interesting about this game at the very beginning, it seems like a silly thing to worry about, but in Settlers of Catan, for example, you start with two settlements. First player chooses one, builds the road. The next player to his left does a similar thing. It goes all the way to the last player and then it snakes back around to the first player. This one was similar in that the first player starts and does that, but then it goes counterclockwise and then back. And I thought that was kind of interesting that it did that. It seemed like there was a good reason for it too, because Andy being the last player, at times there was some downside to that. So it was kind of nice, I think, for him to be able to be the second to choose to place a city. I don't know. It seems like it was almost a big to Nathan because he was the last one we did the counterclockwise, but he was only last for that round and that was only round set up so then he was the first player right so after everybody places their cities then the first phase of the, the game is to change the starting player and then start following the round actions so it's kind of like for example there's games that'll have the starting player and then beginning with the player to the right of the starting player pick it's essentially the same thing right right 
but it's just a different way of saying it. It seemed different. I wasn't expecting it. I thought it was kind of cool. This game is played over six game years. Each game year is broken into eight phases. The first is changing the starting player. The second is that you lay out the voice of the people cards. There's a stack of cards that's going to tell you what the people in the countryside are concerned about as far as politics go. You lay out four cards, one of them face up, three face down. There are three different services that the people are interested in. Culture, education, and health. Each one of those is represented by a color. Culture is white, education is black, and health is blue. One of those cards will be face up, the other three face down. Throughout the year, you have the opportunity to, there may be some politic card that allow you to pull the people. You get to look at two of the face down cards. Or if you pay two gold, you can look at all three of the face down cards. And it gives you a leg up because you know what the people are looking for. Because whichever one of those things the people are actually looking for, the second to last phase is that people will migrate based on what they're looking for and the cities that are close by where they can find those services. This is one of the things that I really liked about this game just because it was such a unique mechanic. The third phase is if anybody who has quarries, those quarries produce gold. The fourth phase, every city grows in population as long as they have space for it. You gain one extra citizen meeple. The fifth phase are the political rounds these are the action phases where there's five rounds where everybody gets to play actions. I'll, ch I'll talk about that in just a second. The sixth phase is tallying the voice of the people. Flip all the cards face up. If health was the clear winner, and that's what the voice of the people wanted, then you are hoping that you built a lot of buildings that increase health. Because the next phase is that citizen relocation where they migrate. If your city is within three hexes of any other city, you then compare to see who has the most health services. There's a public bath, fountain, those are both health services, and the hospital is also provides a health service. These building tile, and it has little arches on the top of it. Fountain has one blue arch. Public bath has two blue arches. A hospital has one blue for health and one black for education. You look at your city, you find any other cities that are closer than three hexes away, and then you compare. If you have more of that color, so in this case, health, that player has to choose one of their citizens from their city and give it to you to go in your city. This is bad for several reasons. Points are represented by citizens. So every citizen that you lose in this way is negative point to you and plus one point to the person who that citizen. Um, but what's even worse is it can have a devastating effect because you can only build a building if you have an available citizen to put in that building. The building can only stay on the board as long as it's manned. It becomes an unused building and basically gets demolished. There's not enough population to support that building. If you lose a bunch of people, Logan in this last play, one turn where he lost three buildings just in one turn from this one city. Uh, because it was run horribly. <laughs> He's sitting right there, Dave. <laughs> happened to me, and it also happened to Andy way earlier and way more devastating well, for him. It was probably a little more devastating for you than it was for me, just because you didn't have time to recover at all. That's true. That, if you look at the scores, if I hadn't lost the five points for stealing more people than I intended to at the very end, I would have beat you in that game. Nathan is the first to get his city decimated, and I can't remember how many buildings the first time when, I think it was one or two, it was two. two yeah. So they and were that was easy buildings to replace. True, but at the beginning of the game when you're trying to get going, I lost two in one round, which was fairly devastating, and you lost three. And then I lost another one the next round. And then you look at the scores, and now if I hadn't lost five points, it would have been you, me, Nathan, and then David, who didn't ever lose anything. And obviously the key is to not lose anything in your cities. The booming but... city that was poorly managed, I stole three citizens from David <laughs> into that city, but I didn't have enough space for them. I didn't have a market. The city is capped out at five, unless you build a market, and then you can go up to eight. And then if you build either a bathhouse or a fountain, then you can have as many as you want. I forgot that key function so i was capped out at five if i was able to actually steal those citizens and then keep building it would have been completely different and i know that happened to dave a lot too he stole a lot of my citizens that he couldn't keep but at the same time he was stealing citizens from my largest city with his tiny little dinky city mm. because i couldn't get the building type to protect myself As david was talking about with the voice of the people it's a deck of cards and then whatever is the majority each round it was completely different it's not like it was Oh, well, it was culture last time, so it has to be education, and then health right. could be education, education, education. If you get devastated one round, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to try to go for this to try to steal some extra stuff. 
and it just doesn't work out because guess what? It's education again. There's enough cards in there. Statistically, it should equal out. But exactly like you're saying, Logan, you can't count on that. Because the cards can come up in any pattern. You Not all the cards are going to get flipped over. So not every card is equally presented. Yeah. Can't say education happened, education happened. So this is next one has to be civilization. Or Culture. it's not like you can just count it out. Throughout the game, there's only going to be two education. Hey, we've done that so I can put my points into culture instead of that. Here's the thing that got me was, so I was by far superior on culture at that point in time, but education came out twice. At that point, Nathan beat me on education and Dave beat me on education, and I never got my city built back to where I could even compete by the time culture came up. I wasn't even a rival. It decimated me enough to where it didn't matter when culture came up. Because it's somewhat random, it's more thematic. I like how it works. It's the voice of the people. The people are concerned about this now. We gotta hopefully be prepared to make our people happy. Or avoid building close enough to other cities. If we're far enough away, then we're not gonna lose those people anyway. We're not close enough that they can see the green grass on the other side kind of a thing. Which that definitely brings an interesting part to this because in my other city, for example, for me to actually be able to grow my city, I had to be near water. And the only way for me to be near water was to build next to both yours and Logan's city. And I was trying to keep that city away and not have to be a rival with you two, but I had to or I couldn't grow anymore. That's the thing with this game is you are forced most of the time to make those choices or you're stunting yourself. Except that was your most populous city. By the end of the game it was, yes. Because you were forced to build it up to compete in that sense. Right. The other one I'd already built up to that point where I could grow, but it got decimated so bad about halfway through the game, it basically stunted it. On the flip side, Nathan and I, we were in the corner of the map, and our two cities that we built up the most were secluded together, and so nobody wanted to come near us, but then we were far enough from each other, we didn't really compete with each other when it came up for that stuff. When I introduced the game, it listed it at three point something for weight. And I didn't necessarily agree with it. Going through the rules and trying to figure out how to play it, that was probably a good rate. I would actually for it. say it was higher to like maybe not that much as soon as you learn it, but the first like round or two, I would almost say it was more than what it says yeah. on BGG. Once you've played through just a little bit, it becomes super easy to understand and know what's going on. Very few building types. You can build a farm to increase your food production. You can build a quarry so you can earn gold. There are three different sizes of buildings. Small buildings, medium, and large. Small buildings are the farmhouse, the quarry, a statue, which is a white service building, fountain, which is blue service building, and then a school, which is the black service building. Medium buildings, you have hospital with health and education. Palace gives you two white services. And then the large buildings, you have a cathedral, which gives you three white, and a university that gives you three black. Very simple as far as that goes. During the political action rounds, you have five actions you get to play. Everybody has three identical action cards. You can play that card to either gain two coins, build a small building, or start a new city. And then there's seven face-up cards on the action card row that you take and use immediately. Some of those cards are build a hospital or build a palace or you have to pay gold to do those. And then there's also a master builder card that will let you build any building, but it costs a little bit more than if you just have the card specific to the building type. There's a card that allows you to just gain population. There's a card that allows you to double the production at one of your farmhouses. There's the pull the people card where you get to look at the voice of the people cards. There's one card called bread and games, which allows you to improve one of your services so that you gain an extra service point of that type. It involves just a bunch of simple strategy, but strategy. It's a simple game. Takes a while to get over the initial like, whoa, this, it seems like it's not simple. But it ends up being simple. It's a fun one. In fact, I borrowed it from Nate and took it up to Preston, Idaho for our family reunion one year, long, long time ago. After the citizen relocation phase, last phase of the year, and it's feeding your citizens. And so you just have to make sure that you have enough food production to feed each of your citizens. If you have 10 citizens, you have to make sure that you have 10 food production. And the food production take little tiles that show how many farmlands your cities border. The map is a hexagonal map, but it has several spaces. That's where you put the terrain tiles, and there's three terrain types. There's farmland, lakes. You have to be adjacent to a lake, build a fountain or a public bath. Then there are mountains, which you have to be adjacent to to build a quarry. Final scoring of the game is, is just simple. Count up your people, 
any city in which you have built one of each of the three color services get an additional three points. Fairly low scoring game. You were the high score with 32. Andy had the low score of 20. I mean, there could have been a possibility that you could get a little higher, but buddy breaking 50 points is... I can't uh, imagine that Yeah, happening. I can't imagine that. But maybe in a two-player game? Maybe. The board is smaller in a two-player. But still, even with a smaller board, that'd be the only way that I can imagine getting up that high. Yeah. If you, if you can progress more than two cities to where they actually have a decent population, obviously the higher the player count, the fewer points you're going to score. Each player can have at most four cities, and if they can support those cities, get those resources, you might be able to get closer to those higher points. This game came out in 2000. We played it several times, and then it got put on the shelf. New stuff came out. Settlers of Catan came out in 1995. This came out five short years later. And there's similarities between La Chita and Settlers. Even the way the players are putting out their cities. It has the area control, resource management. Gold is such a valuable resource in this game. Yeah. You do not get enough of it to do what you want to do. Yeah, this is a game I don't want to just put back on the shelf and not play again for 10. I would like to continue to put it on my 1 by 10. We're playing it at least once a year. Solid game. Very much enjoyed it. I would like to talk about first installment of the West Kingdom series, Architects of the West Kingdom. Permission granted. Awesome. Thanks, Lord. Thanks, Lord. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't recess you. <laughs> <laughs> bought this when it first came out. Absolutely enjoy this game. You are all royal architects. Each player is competing to impress the king by constructing various landmarks throughout his newly appointed domain. And you need to collect raw materials, hire apprentices, and keep a watchful eye on their workforce because these are treacherous times. And your rivals will try to slow your progress, which is one of the best parts of this game. Yeah, it's Andy's favorite. <laughs> so will you remain virtuous or will you be found in the company of thieves and black marketeers like Dave? <laughs> the black market is my jam. <laughs> Quite a few ways to gain victory points in this game. So there's the cathedral that people can build. When you build the cathedral, you're going to gain virtue. You're going to gain points as you're going up the track. And then you also get a bonus card. Uh, one of the other things you can do is you can just build a building in your hand. Everybody has a hand of building cards. Buildings are worth points along with typically an in-game or an end-game effect. So the in-game effect is usually a one-time thing. It's an immediate effect. So for example, say you build the smithy, you're going to get four stone. Whereas you can get a in-game effect. For example, if you have the university and you have zero debt at the end of the game, you get two points. A lot of different strategy that you can go with as far as buildings are concerned. Now to build a building, the buildings have a resource cost. So the resources in the game are bricks, stone, wood, gold, marble, and silver. So you need to have these resources to build these buildings throughout the domain, but also you need to have the correct apprentices to build these buildings. At the top of each of the building cards, there's gonna be a symbol at the top. Sometimes there's even buildings that don't have a symbol. Three different symbols in the game. So there's an axe, hammer, and there's a trowel. These symbols are found on apprentice cards. There's one of the locations in the city you can either gain building cards to add to your hand or you can gain an apprentice. And the apprentices will come in play. You can have at most five and they will give you ongoing effects throughout the game. Along with, they will have one, two, or three of those symbols on the top corner of their card and that will qualify you to build particular building or the buildings in your hand. One of the most interesting parts about this game that I think is one of the most interesting parts is how the worker placement works. Place a worker like a lot of games just worker placement but that worker stays on the board. So let's say I place a worker in the forest to gain wood and I would get one wood for it. The next round if I want to get wood again I can place another worker there but instead of one wood I now get two wood because I have two workers at that location. In a subsequent round I can place a third worker there which would give me three wood. And this is with all the locations. You count the number of workers that you have at that location. For example, the mine, you can get bricks or you can get gold. In order to get gold, you, you get one gold for every two workers you have there. So if I have four workers, I get two gold. For bricks, though, if I want bricks, then I get one plus the number of workers I have there. So it's a little easier to get bricks. Obviously, these workers are accumulating on the board. So how do you get them off the board? This is where the town center comes into play. So the town center, you go there and depending on how many workers you have at the town center, you can pay silver for every worker you have there and every one silver you pay, you can take a group of workers off of one location. This actually differs between a two to three player game and a four and five player game. So in a two to three player game, you can pick two different locations, a group of workers that are the same color off of that location. And you can do that a number of times equal to the number of workers you have at the town center. 
Now in a four and five player game, you have to only pick one location, but you can take any number of groups that you want equal to the number of meeples that you have at the town center. When you take these, if they're yours, they just go back to your supply. If they belong to your opponents, on your player board, you have a little prison that you put other players' workers in, and they stay there until you decide to take them to jail. On a subsequent round, you can take them over to the jail, you place your meeple in the jail. All those meeples that are on your player board go to prison, and you get one gold bounty. Such a great action. Yeah. That's Andy Poop's favorite action. So when you play this with Andy, <laughs> beware. Hey, I didn't win the last game. I believe you kicked our butts, Dave. I with did. Your... The last game we played, Dave had a great engine set up. Your apprentices were so fantastic, worked so well with the black market. There are so many things about this game that are just phenomenal. So many unique mechanics and just new things. But the black market, there are three different spots in the black market. One person on a spot to gain a couple of simple resources or you will place one worker on a spot and gain four resources, and they're usually good resources, it's better than any of the spots on the board. Downside of the black market is you have to pay coins to go there, and you lose virtue. And virtue is worth negative points at the end of the game. But there is an upside to being low on the virtue track. Whenever you have to pay silver to take an action, there are two different colors of silver on the board. There's silver with a red hue to it, and silver that's just a normal silver coin. If it has a red hue to it, then instead of that silver getting paid to back to the supply, it gets paid to the tax stand. If you're really low on the virtue track, you actually get to dodge taxes. <laughs> Either one or two of those coins, you don't have to pay. So being a low on the virtue track can save you silver, but it's also worth negative points at the end of the game. Dave had a fantastic engine going for this, and he destroyed us. actually got to play this two days ago, or three days ago. Played it on game night at my house, and we got to play with one of our listeners, Doug Stewart. It was his first time playing Architects, and he had a good time. I love it. I don't know if it's my favorite of the three between Paladins and Viscounts. I have a hard time deciding right. both such amazing games as well. Yeah. It makes me so excited to do the Tome Saga with it. I, I was agree. really wanting to after this last game. I was like, yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> of course you were. <laughs> <laughs> Could be something we can look into doing at SaltCon if we're not too busy, is maybe doing play all three and run through Tome Saga. That would be a lot of fun. If you haven't looked into the West Kingdom games, the three that are out, they are all great. Architects focused more on city building. I'm always willing to play this game, even if Dave kicks my butt. They've done a very good job with it. I highly recommend it if you have not played any of them to maybe start with Architects. It's always a good place to start. That's Architects of the West Kingdom. It was released in 2018. The designers are Shem Phillips, S.J. McDonald. The publishers are Garfield Games and Renegade Game Studios. Check it out. All right, my city building game is simply called The City. I know. Hold your seats. The City is actually a really great fast, easy game to play. It says 30 minutes, but you can definitely get it down to a lot less time. Oh yeah, you can play six games in 30 minutes. Yeah. Nathan and I would play this game quite a bit last year because it was on his 10 for 10. It was a game that we could sit down, break out, set up, play two or three times before you and Andy showed up because it was such a quick game to get out and get going. The city, it's a tableau builder trying to build two different things. You're, you're trying to either build income cards and victory points. So this game is very similar to Jump Drive. This game is very similar to Jump Drive. The whole goal is to get to 50 victory points. Start with so many cards in your hand, and you have to discard down with your starting hand, and then you're going to pick which card you play, and it's going to have a number up in the top, and you have to discard that many cards to put it into your tableau. Based off of what card you played, you're going to either collect that many victory points at the end of the round, and you're going to draw that many cards. Sometimes it's worth it to discard a lot of your starting cards to put out a really good card at the beginning. And sometimes it's better to put out the little cards. It's really hard to get a really good card that you want, keep it for the rest of the game, ladder round, build it at that time. It's worth it just to put cards that are actually going to help you going towards the game. Yeah, and that's really the ultimate difficulty in this game is get such good cards and you're like, man, I don't want to throw this away. You got to use it to get your other cards out. Kind of get torn on uh, what you want to do. A few little things that tie off of each other. There's the icons, car, a shopping cart, or a fountain. Part of the cards that you build, they're going to have like benefits from it. Some cards, you actually have to have certain symbols in your tableau before you can build it. The shopping mall required that you had to have a car, the shopping cart, in your tableau before you were able to build that. Because it's so easy to get so many different cards strategy to go forward because you're not like being forced into any particular way it's just what cards come out and when Nathan and I were playing last year there was multiple games where we had 20 cards that we draw every round 
Yeah, there was times you get to the point where you're drawing a ton of cards, just looking to discard them because you're looking for specific cards. And that's really the key, right? You want to get to that point where you are drawing tons of cards, especially towards the end, because you've set it up so you're going to gain points based on the strategy you're trying to build. The key is to getting the right cards out. And that's what's so great is if you're able to get to that point where you're drawing 20 cards, before you actually pick your cards, you have to discard down to your hand size. And then from your hand size, you play your card. When you draw the 20 cards, you have the options of looking what is the absolute best card for my tableau this round? Because you're going to get 20 new cards the next round. Well, can I build it? Well, yeah, because I got cards and can discard down and play the best card with that hand. But you can only keep 12 cards. You might have 20 cards, but you still have to No, you have to discard down to your hand size. But then you have the other cards available to build that card. This game, it does not take long because you start at the beginning and you might play a card the first couple of rounds where you get one to two points each round three rounds later you're up to 12 points and either try to nickel and diamond to get to your 50 or you try to hold off and build your engine and then all of a sudden you just start scoring like 15 20 points each round that's what i like about the game is the point progression i mean you're never going to score less points the next round each round each card you play is going to only score you more points or the same amount of points. That game quickly escalates. You think the game's going to last forever, and all of a sudden, two turns later, the game's over. That point skull curve just shoots right up. The game's over before you know it. I think that's what's really nice about it. You're not forced to pay too much attention strategically. What am I going to play this card this round and this one next round? Because the game doesn't last that long for those strategies to really come about. I've only played this game maybe five or six times, and most of them were in one night, <laughs> which I like this. It seemed like there was no clear, oh, I've got to do this. This is the strategy to win. Seeing people win with various different strategies, I think that means the game was well-designed balanced. Definitely a win as far as that goes with the design of the game. I've seen people win it with the nickel and diming. They just simply won because they kept getting two extra, three extra, getting those little points over and over, and so before the other person's engine's built, they've won. But then I've also seen it where people have been trying to do something like that and then the other player plays the certain card that triggers off of all 12 of their engine cards that they have and so they get a huge amount of victory points that round. The weird thing is because it's just like Nathan was saying with the bell curve is that your last turn you score oftentimes so many points because you can go over 50. It's just when somebody gets 250 the game ends. Very rarely I've seen it end right at 50, 51, 52. Normally you get to the last round and you score like 65, 70 points total. Nate's going to pull out the app to prove me wrong and tell me what I said about points wrong. <laughs> the average winning score from the 22 plays that we've played is almost 65 points. Makes complete sense to me. The top score in games I've recorded was 87 points. Going off of my game tracking app, the top losing score, the highest points that you scored and still lost the game, was 78 points. Wow. wow. Kind of sad to score 78 points and still lose the game. Bet you it's because somebody had 45-ish points the turn before and then just scored 33 points the next round. The game is designed to be at 50, so it's a quicker play time. That way your engine just doesn't go crazy. 50 points was like the magic number. That way you're not waiting too long for it to take off, but then already either built or the game's over. I think you're absolutely right. It's nice that it works out that way. The games don't last that long. It makes it quick, easy to play, quick to replay. I thoroughly like the game. I like both it and Jump Drive. It's scratch a little bit different itch, but very similar. Play either one of them any day. They're very similar, but I do like the city better than I do like Jump Drive. And I think it would actually be a good gateway game to get somebody to sit down and play it. It's so quick and so easy. They can understand the strategy and then play it again and kind of get that itch to get the better points from it plays best three to four but it does play up to five 30 minute play time i don't really believe it up to five players maybe you're all playing simultaneously i can't imagine it goes up that much very solid game designed by thomas lehman publishers amigo games all right well we've been going quite a bit here but wait there's more <laughs> another complicated one yay <laughs> the game i picked to talk about this week was underwater cities we got the chance to play this the other day first time for everybody right but me yep i really like the game the game is designed by vladimir suchi released through delicious games or real grand games it's one to four player game so it has a solo option which is really nice i've played it a couple of times solo and it does have that time frame of up to almost 
three hours with 150 minutes. Again, we did play. It did take a little bit longer, not just because of Dave, because there's a lot of strategy and a lot of decisions to make. What's going to be the best choice for you in your city? The next frontier. The Earth is overpopulated. The colonization of Mars is always four decades away. Only one avenue is open for human expansion the world under the sea. Players complete to build the best underwater nation, an archipelago of undersea cities connected by networks of transportation tunnels. Kelp farms and desalination plants will provide your people with food and water. Laboratories will give you knowledge to help you run everything more efficiently. Perhaps you will even need to build symbiotic cities to fully integrate with the underwater ecosystem. I actually feel like the mechanics fit really well with the theme. Each player has their own player map. They start in the corner with their city. You're going to expand that city by building tunnels, branch off into other locations where you can build new cities. So each city has three buildings that you can add to that. You can use the desalination the farm or the lab. You can upgrade those buildings. So you have multiple farms, multiple laboratories, or multiple desalination plants. If you have two of those and they're both upgraded on the same city, you're going to gain more resources. Drastically more resources. Yeah, yeah drastically it's more. Super beneficial. It's not just you got the same resources twice, but it expands on what you're going to collect and what resources you're going to get. When they set up, players will get two credits, three action tiles, get one card that they can add to their tableau, their personal assistant, and then they get one of the resources of the science, the kelp, the steel plast which they will use as resource to build new buildings, new tunnels, or new cities. The one thing I really like is these action tiles. Each round, players are going to have three actions that they can choose. To take this action, there are three color sections around the board where you can take the action. So you'll put your action marker there, and then you'll be able to take that action that is on that corresponding location. You have to discard a card to take that action as well. However, if that card matches the same color location that you picked, then that card's going to provide a bonus action take as well. Definitely behooves you to use those cards matching those colors hand in hand with that location that you're picking. Yeah, I really like that mechanic. I thought it was really cool. Each of those colored locations that you're talking about, right? The top of the board, yellow, the left side of the board is red, and the bottom is green. Each of those colors has six separate actions you can choose. It just gives you a lot of variety in what you can do, especially when you play a card of the same color. Those actions definitely had a Terra Mystica feel to them, but they expanded on it with the different colors. Adding that whole aspect, take that action, color of that side actually matters depending on what cards you play. Very, very well done. I like that mechanic a lot. It was so nice because it almost made the choice I had to get the extra action from playing the color. It almost wasn't worth it to do any other action if I didn't get the bonus action. Those actions that you want to take, the upgrade location that would allow you to upgrade two buildings, is that two what it buildings, is? Two buildings, yeah. And you, so you could upgrade two buildings. That was prime real estate. If you were the first player, that's where you wanted to go. It wasn't going to be there the next time it came around to you. So sometimes you took that action, even though you weren't going to get your secondary card. On almost everything else, you were trying to make sure the card that you were discarding matched the color of that location. Yeah. But it was cool, that consternation that it caused, like deciding, oh, okay, should I do this right now? I don't have the card to make it as efficient as possible. But like you said, it's not going to get back around to me. Toward the end of the game in particular, that was the first spot constantly. There was yeah. constant Which cursing. Which actually the last ended up round. working in my benefit because one of the strategies that I had taken with this was to go for a lot of the special cards in the middle. At this point, I was just like, you know what? They're going to fight over those. I'll just keep taking that spot in the middle and getting these end game bonus cards. Well, that worked out well just because you got bonus points for having those cards right. as well, whereas we didn't. So it right. totally made sense for you to go with that strategy. Right. Talking about those cards, there's five types of cards. The game's played through three eras. First era, the cards are a little bit more simpler. The benefits increase in the era two, and they also increase in era three. But then there's also cards that are on the board. There's a limited number of advance and scoring cards that will give you points based on some condition at the end of the game. Like in Dave's case, if you have more of these end scoring cards, you're going to get a bonus off of those. That cascaded for him to be huge point gain for him towards the end of the game. Those were a huge point gain for him. I got a couple of those, and they were so massive the last few rounds. 
It's almost like a tableau you're building of lightning bolt action cards. The instant effect cards. And I had a couple of those that were just so amazing, totally worth it. One that would allow me to take the action, even if somebody else has taken the action. Which then is huge. Could be huge. Included the uh, center board action, which allowed somebody else to take the action a second time. And so I could go back and take it a third time, so then I didn't have to fight over it. I could go do other things to upgrade my stuff to make sure I got the extra bonus points. Buy different types of cards. There's the instant effect cards. They'll have a cost, so you have to pay resources, but you get the reward. Something like paying one credit to gain two of a specific resource. Action cards. And these action cards will actually go in your tableau. They can be used later because one of the action spots that are around the board is will allow you to use action cards that are on your board. Once it's in your tableau and you take that action, you can then rotate one of those cards to take the action that's on that card. Permanent effect, they'll also go in your tableau, but then these will provide permanent effect for you. So like every time you gain a steel blast, you might gain kelp as well. Production cards, also in your tableau. However, these cards will only come into effect at the end of each round when you do production. They will allow you to gain a bonus for production. If you produce a certain combination, you get some effects with that. And then there are end score cards placed down by you, track conditions that are favorable to you, because if they're not favorable to you, then you wouldn't put it in your tableau, right? Those cards will get you those points towards the end of the game. You're managing everything that's in your hand, trying to manage the correct cards so that you can pair them up with the correct actions that you want to take on the board. It's a network building. You're trying to connect your cities to score points. You need to have your cities with the buildings connected to a tunnel. Like we just mentioned, there's a lot of end game bonuses. Didn't necessarily look like Dave was going to win on his board. However, with all of his bonus cards at the end, huge upswing for him. He ended up running away with the game. Maybe this is because it's been so long since I've been able to play Terraforming Mars. There were some things about it that just reminded me of Terraforming Mars. Terraforming Mars feel to it. Like I say maybe it's just that I'm itching to play, but I felt I really enjoyed it a lot. There's an expansion that's out. New Discoveries gives you a nice embossed board so that your pieces will stay on the board better. Very nice upgrade. Introduces some extra cards as well. Mostly it's the boards really make the expansion stick out. Huge improvement in my opinion. I really enjoyed this one. I honestly can see me just to have it at home. I know that you have it here, but it's one that I can see me wanting to play at my game table and just have it as an option whenever we have game night. Very cool game. I love the resource management side of it. I love the, the way the income worked in this game. Very unique. It all comes down to which buildings you build, which buildings you upgrade. The rarity of certain resources, how it balanced. Really nicely done. Very fun. That's Underwater Cities. That's the last of our four games. I'll took very different games. Thus concludes our tale of four cities. Until next time, we'll see you building your city. Whether it's underwater, whether it's in the Italian countryside, or you're just an architect building a city. Any of those, we'll see you at the game table. <laughs> <laughs>